Chris Christie. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great to be here in Virginia. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's an extraordinary troubling time for our country. And the reason it's so troubling is that we have a nation that today feels more divided than at any time in my lifetime. And we're divided in large measure because our leaders are not providing the type of clarity about what are the important priorities that the people want our country to be pursuing. The first and most important thing to me, not only as a governor, but more importantly as a husband and a father, is the safety and the security of my family. And I respect you feel the same way. And that safety and security is not just about being safe and secure from threats outside this country. It's about making sure that we are safe and secure from threats of violence from within our country as well. We need a president who once again will put law and order at the top of the priority of the presidency in this country. Our police officers, the men and women who stand each day to protect us need to understand that the President of the United States and his administration will give them the benefit of the doubt, not always believe that what they've done is somehow wrong. We need to stand behind the men and women in blue in this country. I spent seven years as a member of law enforcement as the United States Attorney in New Jersey. And during those years, the President I served made it very clear to us that our first job was to protect the safety and security of the American people. And that every other priority, while important, fell in behind that. We need once again to have a President who puts the safety and security of our citizens first and does not blink or hesitate to take the strong action that needs to be taken to make sure that those both at home and around the world know that lawlessness will not be tolerated from anyone no matter how powerful or lack of power that those people may have law and order needs to be the first priority once again in our in our country And in this coming election, there can be little question about where law and order stands and where lawlessness stands. The fact is that we had the spectacle last week of watching a director of the FBI twice in one week repeatedly say that the Democratic nominee for president lied to the American people, that the Democratic nominee for president put her own political convenience ahead of the safety and the security of the American people, an FBI director who said that the repeated assurances that Mrs. Clinton has given us over the course of the last year regarding her email scandal, in fact, in every material way were false. That's not a person who will stand for the rule of law. That's a person who will stand for the rule of her. And that's not what we need in the White House. And everyone who's involved in law enforcement should be rightfully concerned if you have a president who puts the rule of law behind their own personal interests. I support Donald Trump and have for quite some time because I know that he will be the type of president who will put the rule of law first, 
who will make sure that the law is enforced aggressively and appropriately, and it will put people in his administration who understand that the rules in this country and the laws of this country apply to everyone, not just the least powerful, but also the most powerful. They apply to everyone. And so I am grateful and happy that you are here today to lend your voices to that effort and to also listen. Listen to what these candidates have to say. Listen to how Donald Trump will stand up, not only for those who serve today in law enforcement, but also for the men and women who have served in our military. They deserve much better than what this administration has given them. That will, be make, that will mean making tough decisions. That will mean breaking some China all throughout the government. It will mean stopping... It will mean stopping this pattern of accepting less than the best for the people of this country. We need someone who has always demanded the best from everyone who has worked for him and with him and who will place the interests of the American people first and foremost. That is the person who is going to be our Republican nominee next week and it is the person who I firmly believe will serve this country best as the next President of the United States. We need to make sure that we go out there and fight as hard as we can to make that happen. There will be no could have been, should have beens on the day after the election. It's going to be we did it, we fought for it, we stood up and we took our country back to law and order once again. In the seven years I stood as U.S. Attorney, I made sure that justice was both blind and fair. And we need to make sure that that returns to our country. It has left it in this administration, and we need to restore it. And that's why I'm so proud to be with the man that's here, and you're going to hear from him in a few minutes today, because he is someone who will make sure that he absolutely gives you the confidence every night when you put your head on the pillow that his number one priority will be the safety and security of your family. Thanks so much for being here today. It's great to see all of you again. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, Congressman Jeff Miller. The great thing about a military town like Virginia Beach is that there are folks that understand what it means to take care of those that have worn the uniform of this nation. Unfortunately, in recent years, your government has not done the job that it's supposed to do for those who have served this nation. It's not for a lack of money. It's not for a lack of resources nor manpower. The Department of Veterans Affairs budget has quadrupled since 2001. They have almost 350,000 employees. But the same department lurches back and forth every single day from scandal to scandal. And veterans continue to pay the price. What's missing is leadership at the top. As a candidate, Barack Obama promised veterans the moon. As the President of the United States, he has not delivered. His Department of Veterans Affairs has become a model of government dysfunction. What's worse is he refuses to defend a law that he himself signed that would give the Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs the ability to fire those that have done veterans wrong.
Look, America needs a commander in chief that understands the problem that faces the veterans of today and is committed to doing what it takes to solve the problems, whatever it takes. We won't get that from a career bureaucrat like Hillary Clinton, who's so, who is so painfully out of touch with the veteran community that she thinks even though veterans, 40 of them at least in Phoenix, waited on a wait list and died, she thinks that it's been over-exaggerated. She can't solve the problems because she doesn't believe that there are any problems out there. And if she ends up back in the White House, which she won't, but if she ended up back in the White House, we would continue to see scandal after scandal within the Department of Veterans Affairs. But Donald Trump, Donald Trump knows the challenges that face America's veterans today. He has the experience and the leadership that's necessary to boldly reform the Department of Veterans Affairs. He's built a fantastic business, one that's known all over the globe. That's precisely the type of person that we need to boldly reform the Department of Veterans Affairs. And unlike Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump doesn't view VA's problems as a fantasy that's been created by the opposition party. He knows that they're real, and he has a plan to fix them. And that's what we're going to hear about today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you the next president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. What a great group. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank Chairman Jeff Miller. He's a terrific guy. And on behalf of all of those who have served this country in military uniform and for working with our campaign on developing real solutions for our truly great veterans. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you. Before going further today, however, I'd like to first address the contributions of another group who served this country in uniform, the men and women in blue. Thank you. Our police officers. We love our police officers. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. Our police officers rush into danger every single day to protect our communities, and they often do it thanklessly and under relentless criticism. They serve thousands of lives every year, perform countless public services every day, and yet their names will likely never appear in a single headline or media report. But I want our nation's police to know that we thank you from the bottom of our heart. And we support you and we will always, always, always stand with you. The attack on our Dallas police is an attack on our country. Our whole nation is in mourning and will be for a very long time. Yet we've also seen increasing threats against our police and a substantial rise in the number of officers killed in the line of duty. Very big rise. America's police and law enforcement personnel are what separates civilization from total chaos. 
and the destruction of our country as we know it. We must remember the police are needed the most where crime is the highest. Politicians and activists who seek to remove police or policing from a community are hurting the poorest and most vulnerable Americans. It's time for our hostility against our police and against all members of law enforcement to end and end immediately, right now. We went through an ugly chapter in our history during Vietnam when our troops became the victims of harassment and political agendas. For too many police today, that is their daily reality. At the same time, the tragic deaths in Louisiana and Minnesota make clear that the work must be done to ensure, and a lot of work, that Americans feel that their safety is protected. Have to do it. We have to get better. Better, sharper, smarter. We were all disturbed by the images that we saw. We must discuss as well the ongoing catastrophe of crime in our inner cities. Our inner cities are rife with crime. According to the Chicago Tribune, there has already been more than 2,000, 2,000 shooting victims in Chicago alone this year. This epidemic of violence destroys lives, destroys communities, and destroys opportunity for young Americans. Violent crime has increased in cities across America. The New York Times described the startling rise in murders in our major cities. Brutal drug cartels are spreading their reach into Virginia and Maryland. Too many Americans are trapped in fear, violence, and poverty. Our inner cities have been left totally behind. And I'm going to fight to make sure every citizen of this country has a safe home, a safe school, and a safe community. We must maintain law and order at the highest level, or we will cease to have a country. 100%, we will cease to have a country. I am the law and order candidate. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, is weak, ineffective, pandering, and, as proven by her recent email scandal, which was an embarrassment not only to her, but to the entire nation as a whole, she's either a liar or grossly incompetent. One or the other. Very simple. Personally, it's probably both. Not only am I the law and order candidate, but I'm also the candidate of compassion. Believe it, the candidate of compassion. But you can't have true compassion without providing safety for the citizens of our country. Every kid in America should be able to securely walk the streets in their own neighborhood without harm. Everyone will be protected equally and treated justly without prejudice. We will be tough. We will be smart. We will be fair. And we will protect all Americans. Without safety, we have nothing. It's the job of the next president to make America safe again for everyone. Everyone. That promise of protection must include taking care of every last veteran, which was going to be the sole topic of today's speech prior to the horrible attack 
in Dallas. The men and women who have served in our armed forces represent the very best of America. Now is the time to follow their example of unity, public service, and selfless devotion to our nation. We made a promise, and we have to honor the promise that we made to these great heroes. You defend America, and America will defend you. Thank you. But that promise has been broken by our politicians, like so many other promises our country has made, not only to its veterans, but to its citizens as a whole. President Obama has allowed our veterans affairs, health care, all systems, really denied them the help and the support, and really has to do it. We have to get on the ball. We have to do it right. Hillary Clinton recently said of the VA scandal that it's not been as widespread as it's been made out to be. That's a quote. She actually thinks that the Veterans Health Administration is well run. That's because she's been part of this rigged system for a long time. Perhaps it's easy for politicians to lose touch with reality when they're being paid millions of dollars to read on a teleprompter speeches to Wall Street executives instead of spending time with real people in real pain. The disconnect... Thank you. The disconnect in America is deep. There are two Americas, the ruling class and the groups it favors, and then everyone else. The VA scandals that have occurred on this administration's watch are widespread and totally inexcusable. An internal memo from the senior VA official describes, quote, lawlessness and chaos at the Veterans Health Administration, including the payments of $6 billion a year in violation of federal contracting rules. The memo also says they waste millions of dollars by paying excessive prices due to breaches of federal laws and warns that these unlawful acts may potentially result in serious harm or death to America's great veterans. And you know it, and you're seeing it. Even the White House's own Deputy Chief Staff described, quote, significant and chronic systematic failures in veterans' affairs, including a corrosive culture that has led to personal problems across the department with poor management and a history of retaliation against employees who raise issues, and very good issues. He said, he said, there is a lack of accountability across all grade levels. On that, he's correct. Forty veterans, just as an example, have died waiting for care in Phoenix. Forty different VA facilities nationwide were found to be manipulating and falsifying wait times. A VA employee who was involved in an armed robbery was kept on staff, as was a convicted sex offender. The VA spent $8 million on solar panels, good old solar panels, for a facility knowing they would likely need to be tearing it down in the very near future. The St. Cloud, Minnesota VA built a $2.3 million wind turbine in April that hasn't supplied power since 2012. Can you imagine the waste and corruption we'll find when we begin a full investigation in January of 2017?
Thank you. Thank you. Most of those responsible have still not been held to account. Fixing this corruption will be one of my many and really highest priorities. And believe me, it will happen. I'm really good at things like that. It will be fixed, and that begins with a simple promise. Every veteran will get timely access to top quality medical care. Every veteran. <laughs> Veterans should be guaranteed the right to choose their doctor and clinics, whether at a VA facility or at a private medical center. We must extend this right to all veterans, not just those who can't get an appointment in 30 days, or who live more than 40 miles from a VA hospital, which is unfortunately the current and wrong policy. This promise includes guaranteed access to the best available health care services for our female veterans. They're not being treated right. We must also do more to help our veterans find jobs. Every year, large corporations bring in many thousands of low-wage workers from overseas and across the border to fill jobs that could easily be filled by our veterans. Veterans should come first in the country they fought to protect. They fought hard to protect us. They are going to come first in a Trump administration. They will be. They will be a part of America first. It will be America first from now on. America first. Thank you. Thank you. Veterans health care must also include the best mental health care. A shocking 20 veterans are committing suicide each and every day, especially our older veterans. This is a national tragedy that's not talked about. The evidence shows that if veterans are in the system receiving care, they are much less likely to take their own lives than veterans outside of this horrible, horrible, and very unfair system. That is why we must increase the number of mental health care professionals inside the VA while ensuring that veterans can access private mental health care as well. Have to do it. Have to do it. We have no choice. America must take action to improve mental health services for the country at large. This is for everyone. This includes expanding the number of facilities, integrating primary care and mental health care professionals, reforming confinement rules, very important, and making it easier for family members who see warning signs to get their loved ones to the care and of the care they need, especially in the many emergencies that we're having all over the country and doing nothing whatsoever about it. One of the most important reforms we can make is accountability. Right now, when VA employees fail our veterans, you can't discipline them. That's because of outdated civil service rules in need of reform. Have to do it. We like it. We don't like it. We have to do it. It's time. In fact, employees are given bonuses after making bad decisions. In 2014, the VA awarded a $142 million in bonuses to employees, including bonuses to the executives who oversaw construction of the Denver VA hospital that was more than $1 billion over budget. 
Two other VA executives signed abuse, and they really abused, it was terrible, abused their authority to obtain $400,000 in relocation benefits. Currently a scandal, and we're doing nothing about it. It doesn't have to be this way. As Veterans Affairs Chairman Jeff Miller just said, and will say all the time, the VA is not sacred. The veteran is sacred. The veteran is sacred. Thank you. Here is my 10-step plan to ensure quality, timely care for every single veteran in America. One, I will appoint a Secretary of Veterans Affairs who will make it his or her personal mission to clean up the VA. And this will be a person of great competence. This will not be a political hack. The Secretary's sole mandate will be to serve our veterans, our bureaucrats, not politicians, but veterans. <laughs> Amazingly, President Obama's VA Secretary recently downplayed concerns about waiting times by saying that people also wait in line at Disneyland. So what's wrong with that, right? Two. I'm going to use every lawful authority to remove and discipline federal employees or managers who fail our veterans or breach the public trust. Three, I'm going to ask Congress to pass legislation that ensures the Secretary of Veterans Affairs has the authority to remove or discipline any employee who risks the health, safety, or well-being of any veteran. Four, I'm going to appoint a commission to investigate all of the wrongdoing at the VA and then present those findings to Congress as the basis for bold legislative reform. Five, I'm going to make sure the honest and dedicated people in the VA have their jobs protected and are put in line for serious promotions if they continue to do great work. I will create a private White House hotline. That is really, and so importantly, going to be answered by a real person, actually a person, not a computer, that picks up a phone. And that'll take place 24 hours a day to ensure that no valid complaint about the VA and its wrongdoing falls through the cracks. I will instruct my staff that if a valid complaint is not addressed, that the issue be brought directly to me, and I will pick up the phone and fix it myself if I have to. Believe me, I will fix it. Thank you. Seven, we are going to stop giving bonuses to people for wasting money. Wasting money. The bonuses, the money that's being paid out. And start giving bonuses to people for improving service, saving lives, and cutting waste. If an employee finds a smart way to save a large amount of money, that also creates really better outcomes for our veterans, then a small responsible portion of the money saved will be given as a one-time bonus and the rest will be returned 
to the taxpayers, and it will be a lot. We are going to reform our visa programs to ensure American veterans are in the front, not the back, of a line. Nine, we're going to increase the number of mental health care facilities and professionals and increase the outreach to veterans outside of the system, of which there are many. Ten, we are going to ensure every veteran in America has the choice to seek care at the Veterans Administration or to seek private medical care paid for by our government. Never again will we allow a veteran to suffer or die waiting for care they so richly deserve. These are our great people. We need to clean out the corruption in government. And Hillary Clinton will never be able to do it. She's incompetent and has proven time and time again that she doesn't have what it takes. Doesn't have it. Crooked Hillary Clinton. Sadly, sadly, Crooked Hillary Clinton is the secretary of the status quo. And wherever Hillary Clinton goes, corruption and scandal follow. Just look at her life. Our country needs change, and she will never give us change. Never, ever, ever. The fact is, she helped create our rigged system. You saw that last week. Hillary Clinton's America is a country where the elite get one standard of treatment and everybody else gets second class treatment. So true. And she couldn't care less. Despite what she says, she couldn't care less. The rigged system refused to prosecute her for conduct that put all of us, everybody in this room, everybody in this country at risk. Hillary Clinton went to great lengths to create a private email server and to bypass government security in order to keep her emails from being read by the public and by federal officials. What she did was so wrong. What other people did, far less, and they're paying a tremendous price right now. In other words, she was willing to risk our foreign enemies reading her emails as long as the voting American public could not. Her conduct was willful, intentional, and unlawful. And her repeated false statements about her conduct prove that she was fully aware of her guilt. She knew it. She's probably the most surprised person that she was able to get away with it. This was not just extreme carelessness with classified material, which is still totally disqualifying. This is calculated, deliberate, premeditated misconduct, followed by a cover-up that included false statements and lies to Congress, the media, and the American people. In fact, when the FBI interviewed her for only three hours during the Fourth of July weekend, her interview was not recorded, and she was amazingly not even under oath. You didn't know that. She carried out her dangerous email scheme at the same time as her bad judgment and enthusiasm for regime change was unleashing ISIS all across the world. Afterwards, as a further demonstration of guilt, Hillary Clinton erased more than 30,000 emails as part of a cover-up. It's the only reason, part of a cover-up. Hard to believe what's going on with our country. The fact that she got away with all of this 
could be her single most impressive accomplishment. <laughs> to me, it is. It's her greatest accomplishment. When thinking about her email destruction, let's not forget many foreign and corporate entities and other special interests with business before Hillary Clinton's State Department were making massive financial contributions, folks. These contributions were made to both the Clinton Foundation and to the Clintons directly. If elected, Hillary Clinton would become the first president of the United States who wouldn't be able to pass a background check. She would not be able. Just look at what the FBI director said about her. Her misconduct is a disgrace and an embarrassment to our country. Clearly, Hillary Clinton thinks she's above the law. Come November, the American people will show her that she is not above the law. Thank you. Thank you. The decades of decay, division, and decline will come to an end rapidly. The years of America's greatness will return. We are going to become, for the first time in a long time, one united country. We're going to make America great again and safe again for all Americans. We will dream big and bold and daring things once more. Once more, we're going to go big. We're going to go great. You're going to be so proud of your country. Let me conclude by paying tribute to every single American hero who has served this country, and most especially those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you. Our debt to them is eternal and everlasting. We are going to fight for our military and our law enforcement personnel the same way they have fought for us. We will be a safe, strong, and proud country again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.